Dear friends, I am Dr. Vishal Jadav, Department of Sociology, Tilak Maharashtra Vidyapit, Pune. Today we are going to look at a module titled Nation and its Fragments, which is part of the paper on political sociology. What do we understand by the term nation? Benedict Anderson has defined nation as an imagined community. In the colonial period, the British had posed themselves as superior in terms of material, materialism, in terms of technology, in terms of science. They constructed an episteme in which the natives were considered as uncivilized, they were considered as backward. In order to contest this lowly position, the natives had to come up with an ideology of superiority. This particular module will try and understand how the idea of the nation was constructed and in doing so, how an immanent category of Hinduism came to be assigned as uh, the nation in India. The material and spiritual of the anti-colonial nationalism. Partha Chatterjee's reading of the post-colonial nationalism in the context of India proceeds with the critique of conventional histories that trace the beginning of nationalism with the formation of the Indian National Congress in 1885. In such accounts, nationalism is reduced to being a mere struggle of, for political power. The institutional history of coming into being of Congress party and its gradual ascendance to power covers the history of emergence of nationalism in India and also remains the determining feature of anti-colonial struggle in the country. In contrast, Chatterjee's own reading of history of nationalism rests on a principle which according to him forms basis to the distinct ways in which nationalist discourse takes shape in specific history of a colonial country like India. According to him, articulation of anti-colonial nationalism rests on a division or separation between two distinct spheres, namely the spiritual and the material. The material realm is one of economy, statecraft, science and technology in which the superiority of the West represented by the colonial power is an established fact. In the material domain, therefore, the historical task before the colonized was to imitate and reproduce for itself the benefits of the project of colonial enlightenment and modernity. The spiritual realm, on the other hand, represented two, true sovereignty of the colonized. It was a sphere of cultural distinctness from and also superiority over the colonizers of the colonized people and hence needed to be preserved that way. If the material sphere represented the superiority of the colonial rulers, it was the spiritual domain which was the main source of strength and autonomy of the colonized. Therefore, the spiritual domain was one that needed to be preserved from all colonial encroachments. As, for, as was evident beyond a brief phase of enthusiasm on the part of the Indian social reformers for British initiated reforms in the customs and institutions of traditional society in India. The later half of the 19th century saw a vocal resistance against any action of the colonial state to intervene in the cultural traditions of the native people. This, according to Chatterjee, symbolized nationalism among the colonized people. It effectively meant that not only the colonial state was sought to keep out of the spiritual or inner domain, but also that any kind of reforms or interventions in the said domain would be completely in the hands of the colonized masses. Therefore, the essence of the imagined nation rested in the so-called spiritual or inner domain in which the colonized masses were sovereign despite being ruled by an alien foreign power in the material sphere. The historic task before the nationalists was to preserve the sovereignty of the spiritual or inner domain while at the same time to refashion it to fit the need of the changing times. That is, they sought to reform and recreate the national culture to make it modern in all respects. Visible efforts on the part of the nationalists were to produce a modern national culture, which was yet prominent in its difference from the colonial culture by being rooted in indigenous traditions and values. Therefore, nationalism manifested itself in the spiritual domain in a completely different way than its course in the material domain where it increasingly sought to be like the colonizers.
In the remaining parts of the book, Chatterjee traces the history of nationalism through examples from history of the colonial Bengal as it charts a particular course and its efforts to reform the different aspects of the so-called spiritual or inner domain. These different aspects of cultural domain include that of language and literature, education and family, which the nationalists sought to modify to make them in tune with the requirements of the modern world. European influence on the Indian social reformers in each of these cases was visible enough. However, the social reformers including the nationalists embarked on a historical project to assert and establish the cultural differences with the West and prove at the same time through necessary reforms their own capabilities to determine the future by refashioning their own capa capabilities to determine their future by fashioning a modern self for the nation. Chatterjee cautions, Chatterjee cautions us against reducing the dual scheme of material and the spiritual to being merely indicative of any kind of exceptionalism as far as the Indian nationalism is concerned. Rather, he insists that the respective histories of development of two domains of material and spiritual must be perceived in their mutuality to understand the nationalist discourse in India. A nationalist historiography in Indian context must take into consideration the intertwined genesis of both spheres. Each sphere posed as a limitation as well as cast an impact on the other, determining a particular shape. The project of modern politics introduced by the British in the colonial sphere had to negotiate with and accord concessions to the inner cultural politics of the nationalists to produce consent. Likewise, the inner domain of subaltern politics had to readapt to the institutional mechanisms introduced by the colonial rule in the elite or material domain. This interaction between the two domains of politics is a characteristic feature of post-colonial nationalism and has deep implications for the perceived universality of the Western concept of nationalism. It also provides for a deeper analysis of the role played by colonialism in the modern regime of power. Far from being a mere tangential question to the discourse of power in modern times, colonialism is deeply implicated in ways in which modern forms of power manifest themselves in different historical contexts. Therefore, a nationalist historiography, which links the end of colonialism with displacement of political rule of the foreign power, is an incomplete one. The historical narrative of unfolding of modernity in the context of India is a story of continued colonization, a product of modern regime of power. Rule of colonial difference as modern disciplinary power. Chatterjee's analysis is influenced by Michel Foucault's reading of modern concept of power. By this scheme, power is produ productive or facilitative rather than being prohibitive. Modern technologies and institutions of power rule not by being restrictive, rather they aim to normalize social regulations to guide or enable self-disciplining among subjects. Instead of being prohibitive, modern power re reconfigures the social environment in order to guide and affect the conduct of inhabitants of that environment. According to Partha Chatterjee, colonialism in the context of countries of Asia and Africa was the main channel through which the disciplinary power of the modern state was exercised. It is through the rule of colonial difference that the foreign rule maintained its power and also produced consent for its rule. Rule of colonial difference implied that modern institutions of self-representation and democracy could not be replicated in a society like that of India, rooted as it was in deep rooted hierarchies based caste and religion which made it naturally unsuited to democratic organization and functioning. That the otherwise universal principles and institutions of democracy and self-governance could not be applied to the Indian context was seen as an inevitable outcome of an inherently backward, superstitious and authoritarian society in India. Therefore, the colonial powers in India saw the primary task as being limited only to the administration of the country and ensuring welfare of the people and professedly disowned the task of educating the masses in liberal democratic politics. As a consequence, the colonial rule managed to establish its difference from the colonized society and needless to say, race as a category became crucial to the articulation of that essential divide between colonizers and the colonized. Superiority of co colonial rulers as against the inherent backwardness of the colonized society was affirmed by racial differences between the two broad communities.
The established rule of colonial difference had a more profound role to play in the colonial scheme of things. Its more important contribution was to accord legitimacy to the grand exercise of modern colonial state to survey, classify and enumerate its subjects. On the pretext of knowing better the society that was meant to be ruled, modern colonial states strive to gather as much information about the colonized terrain. All the information gathered systematically through scientific ways formed basis to codification of laws and it was this access to knowledge that was the source of power for the colonial rulers. The link between knowledge and power here cannot be overemphasized because, because it was owing to its prerogative and classifying and enumerating the colonial society that the colonial rulers managed to cast an order on it, one that served their interests and was in their control. This particular modality of governance by the modern colonial state was facilitated by a rule of colonial difference which affirmed the disciplinary hold of colonial state over the colonized society. It was through rule of colonial difference that the access of Indians to fair recruitment in colonial bureaucracy, freedom of press and public opinion was denied. A society considered not fit for a responsible democratic system could not find, could find no use for its institutions as well. Nationalist response as an act in self-discipline. What was the response of the nationalists to the growing intervention of the colonial rulers? The, universal, the universality of modern regime and the institutions of power, however imposed, was acknowledged by the nationalists in the material sphere and they were vehemently opposed to the rule of colonial difference which they saw as an assault on that universality. Therefore, nationalist politics was aimed at removing any kind of difference between the colonizers and the colonized in the outer domain of politics. Nationalist resistance to the dom dominance of the colonizers in the material sphere was deemed possible only by fulfilling the lack in self, that is by equipping oneself with the superior techniques of colonizers as far as material life was concerned. This relation of subordination of the nationalists in the material sphere was complemented by a relation of dominance in the cultural sphere. The cultural realm was the domain of sovereignty for the nationalists, which they increasingly sought to keep out of the reach of any kind of colonial intervention. It from within the inner or spiritual domain of indigenous culture, radically different from that of the colonizers, that the nationalists derived an autonomous agency or subjectivity that was articulated as key form of resistance to the corrupting influence of colonial modernity. Chatterjee's in insightful intervention is that the hegemonic project of nationalism in the colonial context of India was based on mediation between these two spheres, which export exposed both its possibilities and limits. The historic task to prove that the colonized were not the inferior other, as projected by the rule of colonial difference, took the nationalists to modernize themselves in the material sphere. In contrast, the cultural or spiritual essence of the nation needed to be preserved in its pristine and distinctive form, precisely because it was the source of self-identity of the nation. This led the nationalists, as Chatterjee says, to selectively appropriate aspects of Western modernity based on the ideological premise that modernity of the West must be tamed so as to retain the essence of national culture. The process of construction of a national culture that was both modern and Indian at the same time was an act in self-disciplining that is an internalization of the disciplinary elements of the modern regime of power. The nationalists took upon themselves to reform and modernize aspects of cultural sphere to make them suitable for modern times. Therefore, in complex ways, the outer and inner material and spiritual public and private correspond to give shape to the hegemonic project of nationalism in post-colonial society in India. Nationalist construction of a historical past, role of the colonized middle classes. Partha Chatterjee calls the project of nationalism as the project of mediation in which the historic leadership was provided by the colonial middle class in Bengal. The ideology of nationalism including its dominant cultural form and institutions were fashioned by the enlightened intervention of the modernizing middle classes. Trained in modern day language of legal constitutionalism, new form of public discourse, the middle classes adapted themselves to the principle of modern government and political mobilization.
as citizens in a modern society exposed to western education and with access to bureaucratic apparatus the middle classes called for eradicating rule of colonial difference which in itself made a mockery of principles of liberal democratic order in this way the emergent nationalism in the political domain led by the middle classes put faith in the modern regime of power and internalized it to cull out a modern public image for itself by contrast in the sovereign sphere of culture the colonized middle classes as script writers of the nationalist discourse had a completely different role to play as said earlier the nationalists had to reformulate the inner cultural domain of nation as per the requirements set by the new modern times such a nationalist endeavor began with the recreating the past for the country especially in the form of written history history writing was pressed into servants service to lend credence to the nationalist project of building up a national culture that was indigenous that is one based on traditional values different from that of the west yet modern such history writing on one hand recreated the past by what chatterjee terms as a classicization of tradition traditional values symbolizing the essence of an indigenous culture were invoked in turn making them timeless and indispensable to the history of the nation on the one hand during the discourse of history writing the nation's past was divested of all the undesirable values both in terms of form and content that reflected its unmodern status therefore the past of the nation was codified via to use chatterjee's expression an appropriation of the popular that is by including those values and beliefs that naturally existed in the indigenous tradition culture of the country and which remained unsullied by dictates of ruthless reason at the same time the process of history writing was itself a disciplinary process whereby the past of the nation was reproduced in a way to accord it a normalized status all negative aspects like vulgarity coarseness localism sectarianism sexualized femininity associated with the traditional culture of society in india was sought to be eradicated from the new codified national history it is not surprising then that the nation's history was built on the identity of an indian tradition that was explicitly hindu all rival traditions like buddhism jainism were appropriated within the recreated hindu fold by virtue of being born in the same country and this incorporation reflected the element of syncretism of indian tradition islam as a contending classical tradition was otherized as being of a foreign origin during the course of construction of a nationalist past national project and the women's question for the nationalist women's question was firmly positioned within the autonomous cultural realm that was the basis of self identity of the nation to repeat an earlier point the nationalists had no option other than to accept the dominance of modernity in the material or outer sphere it was in the spiritual or inner realm that nationalist assumed sovereignty from any external domination and this was precisely because east was considered superior to the west in spiritual terms the duality between the material and spiritual world found corresponding references in dichotomies of inner and outer or home and the world family as opposed to the other outer world which was subject to vagaries of material reality was seen as a private realm that embodied one's true identity it was reflective of one's autonomous self the source of self identity needed to be preserved against encroachment by forces of modernity if the colonized could not escape being hegemonized by modernity of the west in other outer material domain they had to do so without compromising on their true autonomous identity in the spiritual realm the complex dialectic between the material and spiritual led to a division of social space into home and the outside world with corresponding gender roles and a sexual division of labor women as belonging to the essential space of home were the re- were the repository of values of the inner essential cultural sphere the question of family its space within the hegemonic discourse of the nation the corresponding role of women within the family and simultaneously towards nation building her education etc were some questions that needed to be located against this complex exchange between material and spiritual worlds
By relegating the question of women within the inner realm of culture, the nationalists managed to depoliticize it. That is, as Chatterjee says, the nationalists refused to see women's questions as holding any value in terms of political negotiation with the colonial state. Resolution, if any, of the so-called women's question was to be found only by the nationalists and that too in keeping within the framework of traditional values of the indigenous culture. Therefore, Chatterjee notes a distinct reluctance on the part of the nationalists and social reformers by the end of 19th century to allow any colonial interventions in matter of socio-cultural reform and especially ones related to position of women in colonized society. For the colonizers, the inferior status of women in colonized society was reflective of the inherent barbarism of traditional culture of the colonized. With the self-assumed role of imparting civilization to the subject population, the British were able to bring light the oppressive nature of social customs of the colonized and also do justification for their hold over the colonial society on the pretext of reforming the latter by introducing a proper framework of procedural law and rational methods of governance. The nationalists on their part saw an effort on the part of the colonial rulers to introduce reforms in matters of the indigenous culture as an assault on the private autonomous sphere, constituting essential identity of the nation. As per the nationalist agenda, therefore the chief question was concerning the role and conduct of women in changing conditions of the modern world. For both nationalists and the colonialists, the question concerning the status of women was much beyond that was evident at first instance. It was a question of political confrontation between a colonial state and the so-called traditions of a colonized nation. And this largely determined the stance with which each sought to resolve women's issues. According to Chatterjee, the approach of the nationalists towards the resolution of women's question was one that was based on selective modernization. Selective modernization led to a new patriarchy that was based on reinvention of tradition and it did not lead to any substantial transformation in the lives of women of middle class families. Nation and its inescapable other. <clears throat> the unfolding of the universal narrative of modern state in India was far from being a smooth process. Certain inescapable conditions posed as hindrances in its smooth transition. The conceptualization of a single, singular national community had to look for ways to deal with pre-existing forms of communities and consciousness that existed among the colonized subject populations. Peasantry as a community and often a rebellious one was a specific problem which made their absorption in the nationalist anti-colonial struggle ever important. Peasantry as backward, superstitious and ignorant, unsuited to the dynamics of modern times was a perception shared by the colonizers and nationalists alike. Then there was the question of caste. According to Chatterjee, both positions of the nationalists concerning the question of caste were well placed within the framework of modernity. Liberal equality entrenched within bourgeoisie modernity called for a condemnation of oppressive caste practices, while the latter position maintained that caste in its ideal form was not incompatible with principles of universal modernity. The institution of caste as con contributing to maintaining unity and stability of social order is, in the words of Chatterjee, a synthetic theory of caste. Synthetic theories of caste naturalize the condition of relations of dominance and subordination uh, that constitute the principle of hierarchy between numerous castes. As far as the question of peasantry was concerned, the importance of appropriating the peasantry for rendering a mass appeal to the nationalist movement was recognized more than ever. However, the structure of peasant politics was very different from that of national politics, which made such appropriation difficult process for the nationalists. Peasant politics as the other of the formal realm of national politics with roots in bourgeoisie institutional frameworks often posed as a challenge before the latter. Therefore, the nationalists in their approach to the peasants were no different from the colonizers. Therefore, as Chatterjee says, the histor historical narrative of modernity and that of the modern state refused to see the peasantry as an active subject of history, which placed considerable challenge before colonial and nas nationalist historiographies by its form of action and consciousness.
The coming into being of a nation in the Indian context involved a politics whereby the domain of politics of peasants was kept invisible and detached from the concrete political processes and hence denied any historical subjectivity. To conclude, we have seen in this module how Partha Chatterjee deconstructs the colonial historiography and tries to understand the two main spheres that is the spiritual and the material plane and he argues that the Indian nationalists in attempting to contest the colonial episteme constructed an imagery of the nation through its spiritual being. In the sense, they claimed that the natives were clearly superior in their spiritual traditions rather than in terms of the material things of the West. And in doing so, they created an identity that was associated with Hinduism. Thank you.